Okay, super. So let's see, let me see um, what's on the syllabus today. Okay. All right. So everybody's logging in to the site and going to the live stream. So the, the thing is grading stuff like the small business project is pretty time consuming because you have to look for lots of different elements and you have to run the program. And when I run the program, I'm not looking for um, ways to break it. I'm more looking for just does it does it run provided that people enter what would be expected with the prompt. So if somebody says enter the number of popsicles, if you type a number and it works, then that's good. If it says enter the number of popsicles, I'm not going to type any words. Right? It's not it's not an assignment that you uh, were expected to spend like 50 hours on, right? It's it's just an assignment that could be done by a really fast student during class. So each, each class, the Monday, Wednesday, and the Tuesday, Thursday, there were people who got it done during the time period. And then, you know, I, I said that during class and, and somebody typed out, oh, it took me seven hours to do it. And, and I said, well, it takes everybody different amounts of time, but that seven hours is not time wasted. That that seven hours is is valuable that you spent that long doing it. That that's how I would respond to a student like that. <clears throat> so it it really okay, two hours, that's that's pretty pretty good. Maybe maybe shorter than average, I, I would say. Um but just things go wrong when you're doing it and and it's it's just the way it happens, right? Okay, so maybe three hours in, in total. It's just the way it happens when you're learning something new that you're going to need time to reflect on things, and there's, there's just no way around it. It's just you have to spend a lot of time doing it. So that's actually the first thing that I have on the website today. Even before we look at the syllabus, I just wanted to show this article. <clears throat> so it says, oh, oh, I don't have it on here. I'll, I'll go get it for my Java class. So I'll, I've been talking about it in each class, but I just posted the link yesterday in the Tuesday, in the Monday, Wednesday chat. And, um, you know, don't forget with with Discord, you can mute notifications from different channels. So you don't have to get all the Monday, Wednesday notifications. So you can just right click on the on the channel and just say mute channel. Anyways, let's go to this link and then this link.
Okay, so this is called How to Teach Yourself Programming in 10 Years. Let's take a look at this article. All right. <clears throat> so, first of all, the man who wrote this, I guess we'll do like an appeal to authority first. The man who wrote this is a Google Research fellow. Oh, he's, excuse me, director of research at Google. So that's pretty high up there in terms of the world of development, right? Just to get a job at Google is pretty difficult. And then if you're at Google and you're so good, they make you a director of research, then wow, you are really good at what you're doing. and probably somebody worth paying attention to. So we see here that he says, look, in 24 hours, you can't learn anything. You, you, you can't do anything in 24 hours. Like somebody can tell you some syntax and what's that going to do for you? So he says, consider this a 10 year plan, right? Where, where you're starting now, maybe you're age 18, maybe you're 20, who knows, right? Like maybe we have people in their 30s in the class right now. I don't know. But just think about the 10-year plan and what is it going to be like in 10 years? How, how will you be producing software in 10 years, right? So yeah, you'll be 40, but that still gives you a lot of time to develop a lot of software. Right? Like if you're 40, you can still still do a lot of stuff. Now, it's not like he's saying, oh, it takes 10 years and then you can do something interesting. Along the way, you can you can do interesting things, but you do need time to build up your skills as you're you know, as you're growing in this field. Like you're not just gonna be able to snap your fingers and do the most amazing stuff. It takes time. So he even gives examples about Mozart who even as a musical prodigy took 13 years to produce world-class music. And this is the number he focuses on, not just, not just the years. Don't just think about the years, but think about the hours of practice, 10,000 hours. All right. So what does he say to be a programmer? Well, the first thing I want to point out about his recipe for programming success and, you know, later when you have more time, you can go through and read the whole thing. But look at this. He puts college on the fourth bullet point. So that's, that's pretty telling that he says, first thing is you got to do it. You got to do programming, get interested in it. And then he talks about writing programs. And then he talks about reading other programs. And then he says college. So, you know, I'm a big believer in college. I like being a professor here at Miami-Dade. I like interacting with U.S. students. But if you just show up to class and then that's it, don't touch programming for the rest of the week, it's just not enough. You, you have to put in more time. So while you're in this class, of course, you got to do the assignments because they're for a grade. Um, and a few people are not doing the assignments, which isn't good, um, because I have to abide by the due dates. But just beyond just the class and the grades, you need to think about how to grow in the field. And even if you're not going to be a programmer, even if you're going to be a systems administrator, or I mean, there's a million jobs that will require some knowledge of programming, that programming would help you be, do better at the job. Um, even if you become a journalist, you know, journalists now work with lots of data and it would definitely help if you knew how to deal with that data, how to work with that data. So 
by signing up for this course and trying to take an interest in programming, you're really helping yourself for the future. It's, it's definitely a good thing. Okay, so if we go on with the article. Yesterday, somebody in the class asked me a really good question when we were talking about this. Somebody on Monday, Wednesday said, how many languages should they learn? And I said, I don't know. I don't have an answer for that. I knew that Peter Norvig had given a response to that. I couldn't remember the exact number. And then in this article, my eyes glanced over it. He says to learn six. He says to learn at least a half dozen. Okay. So his advice is learn at least a half dozen programming languages. Um, my point in class yesterday was that some of them are very similar, like Java and C++ are similar. So when I get students in my Java class and they say, oh, I was so good in C++, but now I'm not good in Java, I mean, <laughs> that, that's weird because the languages aren't that different. Like there's some learning curve, but, um, Let's see. So it says, how long does it take to learn a single programming language as opposed to a speaking language? Oh, I would say probably quicker to do to learn a programming language. Um, but I think like depending on the type of problem you're going to solve, you might need to learn more stuff. Like like if you want to be a game designer or game developer in a language, the syntax might be pretty easy, but then some of the math behind making the game look right might be a challenge. And, you know, if you're learning a, a speaking language, you're probably not going to be speaking to people about um, tangent and sine and cosine. So, like, sometimes when you're talking about learning programming languages, you have to think about how you're applying the programming language, like what domain. So sometimes there's special knowledge for that. But just, like, in general, to solve basic uh, hacker rank problems or basic Code Wars problems, I'd say it's much quicker to learn a programming language than a speaking language. And that's something I've actually always been jealous of people who are really good at learning languages. Um, but let's see. So then it says, would the next step for us be Java or C Sharp? Well, if you're following the Miami-Dade plan, if you're following the MDC plan, the next step for you is Java. And I'm, I'm teaching one Java class in the, um, let's see, so that would be the fall. And right now I think there are a few openings, so it would be nice to see some of you. I imagine it's going to be in person, um, which is good. I, I think that my own opinion about the reopening and everything is we do need to open the college. Apparently, they're doing a lot of um, temperature checks. I don't know if you guys saw the Miami Herald article about it. And then it says, shouldn't you just try to learn a language based on what you want to work on? Well, um, I, think, I think that's sort of the difference, Jose, between being um, like somebody who, who just uses the language to solve problems and then somebody who is really super passionate about developing languages and um, like, like the, the focus is either on solving a problem or on the actual language itself, right? So if you're somebody who, who is more interested in like engineering, then yeah, your first answer would be totally right. Like just learn a language based on what you want to work on. And then you don't have the same interest and drive to like really get into the nuts and bolts of the language it's just a tool that you're using but if you're if you're somebody who um has an interest in in compilers or designing your own language or things like that then then you would probably follow peter norvig's approach more right um well i i would say okay so that that's that's a great question um for money in this world, I think specializing is money. You need to specialize. Like if you if you're good at something that's in demand, then you'll get paid if you're if you're the best at it. Um, yeah, no, specializing is the way to go. That's 
those people are absolutely right. I totally agree with them. You have to become a specialist. The only thing is like what you specialize in, the, the market will demand different things over time. So you have to be able to specialize possibly in different things. So you might need to specialize in something else. That, that's just the reality of the field because, you know, you might be really good at something, but then it changes. Now, things don't change always as quickly as people think. Like, when I was in college, I was taking Java and C++ courses and C courses. And guess what languages 20 years later are still used? The same ones, Java, C++, C, they're, they're, they're still there. So, I mean, I'm able to teach college classes in classes that I took in college. And um, the languages have changed. Like, you, you do have to keep up with, with Java. Now, with C++, this is an introductory course. So, I don't really have to stay on top of every new feature in the language because we don't even cover them in this class. Like, it would... It just wouldn't like it, and I first of all, C plus plus isn't my favorite programming language. So, um, yeah, yeah, you you should never stop trying to learn new languages. That that is true. That is true. So the more you can learn, the better in this field. I mean, um, it's just a, just the reality of it. All right. So he gives some more good advice here. Uh, yeah, it's like being multilingual. Like, of course, somebody somebody in Miami who can speak Haitian Creole, can speak Spanish fluently, can speak English fluently, they're going to be at an advantage over somebody who can just speak one language. And then if if somebody can speak four or five languages, it just opens up even more doors. So, yeah, it's 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 not a bad thing to to be able to do to speak more languages. All right. Great. So, he gives some references, and I think it's a really good article, so you can check it out in your free time. <clears throat> okay, so let's look at what's on tap for today. So we have a quiz on looping, and then we have an, a new exercise on Memer. And another thing that I thought would be good is... I, I was getting messages in um, on Discord saying that people didn't understand Bool. They just didn't know how to work with Bool, and it was too confusing to use Bool on their program, so they just left it out. And I'm, I mean, okay, I'll do I'll do examples with Bool today, but really, if there's something that you overlooked in class, you gotta. You got to get in the habit of doing things like this, C++, bool. And then you click on the first link, and you see very often in programming, you will need a data type that will have one of two values, like yes, no, on, off, true, false. For, C, for this, C++ has a bool data type, which can take the values true or false. Okay. So... If we actually go back and look at the assignment, let's go back and look at the small business assignment. Okay. You need two numeric values, a Boolean and a string. All right. Two numeric values, a Boolean and a string. Well, but... So this small business project you didn't submit to Memer. Small business project was submitted to Freer School. Okay, so is isn't the expression in the loop already a bool? So th the test int i equals five, and then you know is five greater than or equal to Okay, so we have here while, that's okay. Well, we can get to that, Roger. While i is greater than zero, 
Okay. So <clears throat> inside the while loop, yes, that, that evaluates to a true false. That evaluates to the true false. But here when I say here when I say you will need to ask for two numeric values, a Boolean and a string that are relevant to the small business. Okay, let's just copy this and paste it in here. So the way I would interpret that is you're actually working with, like we're dividing the number from the bool. So you can have an int or double or float for numeric. And then the Boolean, I just really expect some sort of bool variable. Bool for Boolean, right? And then the string, the string is for the word. Now the string, some people used an array of characters and some people used the C++ string class. Either one is fine. Now, well, I did look carefully. If people were really explicit in the way they, they prompted the user, like they said, enter zero for false and enter one for true, and they stored it in an integer, but they had a comment that said, this represents the bool, then I was pretty careful to give them credit. So I really do read these closely. Um, I mean, that that to me would be acceptable, but it needed to be like a real acknowledgement of the bool, right? So, so that, that's the idea, okay? So um, let's see. So yeah, most people turned it in. Um, let me let me just tell the student I'm actually in class. Um, I'm actually. All right. So let's see here. Um, <clears throat> so we have here, we have here a good doo -doo 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 -doo, small business project. Okay. So yeah, that's, that's what I wanted to say about that. And now we can actually try to work with the bool. Okay. So let's go ahead to a REPL. Let's all go to REPLit. Actually, I just might look for the one from yesterday. Constructors, Shakes Business. Oh, they're under unnamed, I think. Yeah, unnamed. Yeah, there's so many. It might be quicker just to just to rewrite it. Yeah, that's okay. I'll just redo it. No big deal. Okay, so let's go here to my rep. Let's go to home, new REPL, and then we got C++ and create REPL. All right, so let's start with the bool. So we say bool b, and then std cn into bool, and then we can say b, then good choice. Okay, so let's run it. And let's try to type out true. Hmm, what happened here? Why did C++ not accept this? Right. 
it out so nicely? Um, because you forgot to put B. Well, I've got B in here. I've got if B. And that, oh, I see what you're saying. You're, you're, yeah, if B actually means the same as if B equals true. So, so the reality is when you're reading things in from the console, it's a little different with C++. Let me try it with one. I'll, let me type in one. So if I type in one, then it says good choice. <clears throat> so by typing in one, it will work. So typing in one will work, but true will not work from the console. Okay? So typing in one will work, but true will not work from the console. And that's just one of the quirks of the language. Just one of the quirks of the language, like the way it was designed. So the input from the console and the output from the console, like let's try to print out B. Okay. So we've got here one, prints out one. We run it again. We've got zero, prints out zero. Now, what if I was to change this instead of reading it in? Let's just comment out this reading it in, and I'll just set B equal to true and run it. Well, guess what? Even if you set B to true, even if you set B to true, it will still print out one. So in the end, <clears throat> I'm glad that the students asked that question about they wanted more time to think about bool because it is good to talk about some of these quirks of the language you know it's it's not a um it's it's not a bad question to inquire more about something like why does this work and why does this not work so why don't we do the same with any other questions that you have like what are some other aspects of the language that maybe doesn't make too much sense, right? Like, what, what are some things that, that you guys are, are curious about, right? Like, we could just make this an open-ended open -ended time to review the C++ language. You know, with anything that we've talked about so far. Right, like, like if we look up newest features, newest features of C++, and we start looking at some of their, some of their most recent versions. So we're on C++ 17. We can go down here, and, I mean. Removal of trigraphs. Okay. Removal of registers. Removal of deprecated operator plus plus. <clears throat> um, Trying to just look for anything relevant. Here's a word you don't see very often. <laughs> uh, let's see. Yeah, okay. Jose's right. I saw that one and thought that might be worth talking about because it's something that we've we've covered. Um, 
So before, well, okay, so that's actually exactly related to what we're talking about because we're talking about here how in C++ we're using 0 and 1 from the console to read in the values, right? And, and C++ is treating these as numbers, right? It's treating the bool as a number behind the scenes. Now, the language also will allow you to type in true. You can also add the value of true. But let, let's try this out. Let's start bool as false. And I think C++ is, they're going to have the, the older version, not the C, CPP 17, because um, it's, they're not going to have that on Replit. So, so what we can do is we can say B++. And let's run it and see if it works. No, never mind. I take that back. So it says here, it says here, it is no longer valid for bool operands. So I was wrong. They do have the version that made it not valid. So we can't do this. So this is not allowed. So their, their version on Replit is sufficiently new. Oh yeah, and here's why. Look, I thought, I thought they used the older version of C++, but no, they use the newest version of C++. See, because look what it says. It says C++ 17. So that's what this article is about, C++ 17. And it says, I mean, you know what? I'm here's here's a funny thing about C. So it, it used to be that C eleven would be the version that we use in Miami Dade, right? And um just for years and years and years. And I think some of my colleagues are still like focusing on C eleven and then when I think about it, it's 2020 and, you know, 2017 is pretty long time ago, like in the world of technology. So now that I like step back, yeah, of course, Replit is going to be keeping up to date with things. Um, I don't know. I, yeah, they, they're not going to have a decade old version up there by default. Right. So that, that makes sense if I think about it. I, I was just sort of comparing it to the older version. Um, yeah, you can't you can't increment the bool with plus plus. So no, it's not it's not going to affect int. So you you can use it with int, but you just can't use it with bool. Like I guess the point is. The C++ language designers are trying to make bool separate from int. Like you're thinking if you want something true, false, treat, use the bool and don't treat it like you can increment it. Cause now you can't increment it. You can't go from false to true. So I was thinking they weren't on this first. I mean, I went over that three times, so I won't keep saying it, but yeah. You can't increment the bool. All right. Yeah, int int is the same idea, right? Like like if you say if if one here, let let's try that. So Jose is bringing up a good point. So let's say here we've got int user decision. We'll just say user equals zero, and then we'll say std c out. Enter zero for false or one for true. Okay, and then we'll use CN into user. And then we can say if user, then C out you chose. You chose true. Okay, so let's run this here. 
and let's see. Okay, so it says enter zero for false or one for true. If we say one, it says you chose true. Okay, so yeah, you could use zero, you could use an int like a Boolean, right? So if somebody was like really explicit in their comments and said int is being treated like a Boolean, I mean, it, it can do the same thing. Now, what if we enter 15 for true? Well, if we enter 15 for true, it, it's fine. The only thing is zero is false. Any other number is true. All right. So it says it wouldn't make sense to increase the bool if it's already one. Uh, two wouldn't be a true false statement. So yeah, Jose puts in the kind of the point that I was going for here. Any non-zero value is true. Any non-zero value is true. So here we have this link. So you can click on it. I think I put it earlier, but if not, there it is again. Okay. But, you know, truthfully, um, C++ is a huge language. It's a complex language. Um, they, they're always adding features, taking features. I, I would say even more so than other languages. Like if you compare C++ to Python, C++ has way more features. Um, just, it's huge. All right. A bool was any expression that was tested as true or false. So bool is something that's true or false, but the bool data type is something that, that is separate, right? Like, like bool data type in C++. Okay. All right, let's go to Geeks for Geeks. All right, so this says, uh, the C++ standard has added certain new data types to the original C++ specifications. Okay, in C++, the data type bool can hold a certain value, true or false. True or false have been added as keywords in the C++ language. Okay. I mean, that's pretty, pretty much like what we've been talking about. <clears throat> so it says here, hmm, so bool's value can only be assigned either through initialization or CN. Well, I mean, if we look at this example here, we see that I, this is kind of not what you were talking about, but we can use bool type variables in mathematical expressions. I mean, I guess you could you could send in the value of you could also send in the value of of bool from a file, reading a file would work too. So you could you could set it from different areas. Like um, if you find that there's a zero or a one in a file, you could set a bool variable to it or a true false. That would work. Hmm. Anyways, there's there's just a lot of new features. Let's look at searchers. That looks kind of interesting. If you have to search a single object in a string, you can simply do that by using find or various other alternatives. The searching patterns or subrange in a string is a bit complicated task. Okay, this is a thing worth talking about here. This is called big O notation. Okay, big O notation. And big O notation is used by computer scientists and programmers to talk about how long will your code take to execute as the problem grows. So you could have a problem that's exponential where 
you double the data and it's it's like squaring your time to deal with the problem and that's bad you don't you don't want you don't want problems that grow like that <laughs> that's that's not good then you can have linear you can have um you know lots of different ways of of looking at how long the problem is going to take to solve as the data increases so that, that's the thing just to briefly talk about you'll learn more about that when you take a course called data structures and algorithms and it's all about the analysis of algorithms big o notation is about how you analyze the algorithms just for their efficiency that's what you're really looking at all right so anyways we can close this link here about what's new in c plus plus but the language does change a lot and i don't know i don't know if there's much else to talk about the bool data type i think we've sort of covered well i i realize that they are using c plus plus 17 in REPL, which totally makes sense professor yes can you go over some of the looping stuff for me yeah sure let's do some more loop example that's great i think that that's a excellent excellent thing to to review what loop should we start with this is a simple one Okay, let's start with a simple loop. So let's let's actually do a new REPL and we'll do a new C++, we'll call it simple loops. All right, so we'll call this simple loops and we'll start with a really basic loop that's going to count down from 20 to zero. So we'll use a for loop, for loop to count down from 20 to zero. Okay, so we're gonna start with a variable that we're gonna call counter, int counter. So counter is what we're gonna use to keep track of what number we're on. So now we start our for loop. Okay, so here's the thing. If you write four in all caps, it's not going to work. It will not work. You have to follow the C++ case sensitive rules. So there is a certain amount of rules that you have to follow in C++, right? That's just obvious. So we write four in all lowercase. And then we're going to say counter equals 20. Now we have one semicolon to separate the initialization from the test. Now this test will evaluate to a bool. This will evaluate to a true false statement. This is a Boolean statement. So Jose was saying before, don't loops run on Boolean. Yeah, they do. As long as the loop is true, it's going to continue. When the loop becomes false, it stops running. So we have to write an expression in here. We can do a while loop next, sure. Let's just finish this one and then we can do a while loop. So we can say, while well, counter is greater than or equal to zero, and then in the third part of the for loop, we're going to decrement the counter. So we'll say counter minus one, or we'll just do counter minus minus. That's, that's nice, I like that, okay? If we just did minus one, it wouldn't store the value. So counter minus minus is the best way of writing this out. And now we actually want to display it. So we're going to say STD C out counter and then end line. Okay. So if we run it, we see from 20 to zero. So nobody has any problem with that, right? Like that for loop that counted down that made sense people are good with that I mean, we've done a lot of examples with for loops so okay so now the request was let's do the same thing with a while loop so we'll have a while loop that counts down from 20 to zero so again uh we need a variable could we use counter sure we could use counter so we could say counter equals 20 just reset the variable and then we say while counter is greater than or equal to zero why don't we write it differently this time while counter is greater than negative one 
we can say std c out counter and line. And then we have to say counter minus equals one. So let's run it. And we see 20 to zero and then 20 to zero. No big surprise, right? These are the same thing. So these two loops here do the same thing. All right, let's see. For me, I have a bit of trouble understanding how to use a while loop in place of a do while. Loop. Okay, so why don't we do why don't we do a while loop for a menu program? That's that's a good idea. So here, I'm just going to comment out these print statements. But I'll stay in the same REPL. Okay, so we'll call this simple menu state uh, simple menu program. So we'll have a variable called bool. Um, for some reason, I always like to call my, my loop variables to continue. So we'll say to continue equals true. Then we'll say while to continue. Okay. So let's give some different prompts. How about we say, how about we just have a program running that is going to ask people for their favorite programming language. So the menu will be different programming languages. So what do you think are the most popular programming languages in the world? Just sort of, sort of list out the most popular languages. And we'll just take like the first five. Okay, so we have Python, we have C, okay, C++, Java. Okay, that's good, stop, stop, no more. <laughs> so we'll, we'll just go with those. So we're gonna have int Python, C, C++, and then we'll call it C++ and Java. Okay. Okay, so all those are going to be, these are going to be our counters for the program. And then we're going to ask the user to enter some different languages. Okay, so like what their favorite language is, but We'll do it with we'll do it with A B C D. So Python will be A, Python will be A, C will be B, C is C, and Java is D. All right, so let's let's have some some print statements here. So we can say enter your favorite programming language. All right, and then we can say here A for Python, B for C, C for C++, and D for Java. And we'll put a new line. Okay. So now we're going to read in. Actually, this that was these are the counters, right? And then we'll we'll need a variable for the user entry. All right. So we can say int user. Well, it shouldn't be an int, it should be a character. Char user entry. And then we can just do the cn.get equals cn.get. Okay, so this will read in from the console the user's choice. Okay, so now we've read in the console. So we've done a lot of if statements. Why don't we do a switch statement now? Let's do a switch statement. So for a switch statement, we start with the word switch. 
And in this example, what do you think we're going to switch based off of? Somebody who's following along, just take a, take a shot at it. What do you think? Okay, yeah, we're going to switch based on this character. So we can just type in there user entry. Okay. And now for each of the different choices, what am I going to write? Somebody who's done a switch statement before and they remember. Um, you're going to do the different uh, uh, situations. True, true. The different situations, like the different programming languages. So yeah, it looks like Armand's got it. We're going to do different cases. So we're going to have one case for A, okay? And with our case A, we're going to have they selected Python, right? So we can increment the Python counter. We can say Python plus plus, and then we'll break. And the other option is they select B, which is going to be for C. So we can say C. I like that, C++. And then we have case, well, we should break too. Okay, that's to stop cascading answers. And then we have here um, case C. And for case C, then we're going to do um, C++++++. Break. Then we have case D. And that's going to be Java plus plus and break. And then the default is default is they didn't enter anything right. So we can just print out a message. We can say C out invalid entry. Try again. Invalid entry must be A through D. Okay, so enter your favorite programming language. And after we read this in, we want to give the user the ability to quit, right? And we're going to do that with to continue. So now we'll say, see out, well, got it to the STD, STD, see out, enter zero to quit. Anything else to continue? Okay, enter zero to quit, anything else to continue. So we can CN into can CN into um, what was it called? To continue. And then we can, because we're going to be pressing enter, we can just ignore the Ignore the enter. Okay, so let's go ahead and run this and see if that works. So we'll say, enter your favorite programming language. All right, well, I like Python. Okay, enter zero to quit. I don't want to quit yet. I press one. Enter your favorite programming language. Somebody else comes along. They like Python. So now they're at A. And then we're ready to quit. We say zero, and it quits. Now, one nice thing might be to print out the different results at the end. So at the end, when everything is said and done, let's say here are the results. Here are the results of the survey. So we're just making a simple, simple survey here. So we'll say, we'll go in order, Python, Python, and then we'll do a, a new line and we'll say C. And we can probably format this nicer with IOMANIP, but whatever. We'll, we're just doing it pretty quick. We can say C. And we'll have, we'll just do two spaces and we'll do C. And I think I spelled it out, C++. And then we have Java. Uh, and 
two spaces. And then we'll do Java. And then we'll do whatever. Like that. Okay. So let's see how that looks. Python, C, C, C++, Java. All right, let's see how it looks. So we go here. First person votes for Java. Okay, they want to continue. Next person votes for C++. They want to continue. Someone votes for C++. Now they want to quit. So it says Python, C, Java. What is going on here with these numbers? What is possibly going on? Well, the problem is, I think I only set the last one. Yep, that's what happens when you're in a hurry. When you're in a hurry, you don't pay attention. See, but that's what you do. You fix programs. Something goes wrong, you fix it. So here, now we're going to have zero for all these. And we can say here, A, 1, B, 2, so somebody said, what happens if you do something invalid? That's what, you, what happens if you do something invalid. It goes crazy. So that's, that's as programs get more advanced, you really have to do lots of error checking. You need lots of error checking. Yeah. And, and the truth is for something, yeah, things like cn.ignore, um, try cat, you know, depending on the language, try catch, but it's, it's really, really important to do error checking. Now for this small business project, the way I treated it was spend a couple hours on it, get something that works, assuming that people are going to enter what you expect. Now for a final exam, after we do lots of practice, then I'm going to be looking, okay, have they thought of all these different ways to stop the program from breaking? And, and there will be like a bit more pressure on it, right? Um, but for, for right now, like the way we're writing this out in five, 10 minutes, um, oh, how to repeat the process if the input was invalid. Okay, so you're saying like, if the user enters something wrong, you want to require them to enter something again? Okay, so like, like before we read in this to continue here, all right, it says enter one to enter zero to quit, anything else to continue. All right. Um, I actually think this, this situation here can be remedied by a while loop, right? So we can say enter zero to quit, one to continue one to continue okay so i think in here we can say okay if to continue is not equal to if to continue is greater than one or to continue is less than zero. Let's see. No, that's not going to work. What can we say here? Let's see. So the point is, the point is you want to check to see if they enter something that's not zero or one. Hmm. Let's see. What would be the best way to approach this? We could say... If to continue, to continue is not equal. Hmm. What is the best way to error check for this? This is a this is a tricky one. Let's think. If to continue, you know what we do in a situation like this. How to check if C plus plus bool is valid? Hmm, let's see. 
So the problem is right now, okay, this is actually super related to what we were talking about before. The, the situation is, you know how we can do this? There's a simple way we can solve this. Watch this. We can, instead of making to continue a bool, why don't we go ahead and say int to continue, okay, equals one. And then we can say down here, enter zero to quit, anything else to continue. And now we should be able to enter anything other than zero, and it should be good. Let, let's try it. I think this is the simplest way to fix it. Okay, so enter A for Python, one. Okay, that, that of course works. We expected that. B, five. Okay, that's good. And then what if we say something like P? Okay, P is invalid entry, must be A through D. All right, so we say P, okay? So enter zero to quit any, any other number to continue. Enter zero to quit any other number to continue. But it's interesting if they enter a letter, it, it quits. Yeah, <laughs> you gotta love debugging. That's the hardest part is figuring out these little these little situations that can come up. What can the user type in that can break it? And that's where you really have to sit there and think, hmm, what if the user types this? What if the user types this? And you just have to have to deal with it. Like looking at this P that became looking at this P that broke it. Okay, let's let's see this. A P. Okay, so it looks like the P is being read in as a zero. Mm, so let let's Google for that for a second. So we've got C plus plus char char. Oh, you know what? It's being read in as a string. Probably that's why. Yeah, that's why. That's why. That's what's happening. If you think it through, we're we're reading it in as a string, and C plus plus doesn't know how to turn a string into. Yeah, that's it. No, no, no. This is this is exactly it. The C plus plus string string can't be converted to int. So when I type p. C++ tries to convert to a number, and you can't do that. So we get zero. So we get zero. So again, this just brings up new debugging, new debugging. One thing that we can do is we can try to read it in with the just getting the character. That, that might be something that we could do, read it in just doing the character. Or we can check to make sure it's numeric. Right? And if it's if it's not numeric, then we can ask them again to no, you have to enter in a number. So like all these things that we're discovering as we're typing them out, this is just how you deal with user entry and dealing with the different um the different situations. And there's always a lot of different ways to solve these problems, right? Like we can we can restrict what the user is able to enter um, and then check to see if they enter in anything greater using the ASCII codes. Have we ever looked up the ASCII table in class before? The ASCII table is super useful, right? Let's see why, why it would be so useful for this. Well, we can, we can check to see what they entered in and then based on what they entered in if the if the value is not in that range we can make them enter it in again right so 
what is the ASCII code? What is the the numeric representation of the character zero? Look on the chart for zero. Okay, we've got 48. And then for one, it's 49, right? So yeah, so if we only want numbers, we will say, okay, you entered something less than 48 or greater than 57, we're not accepting it. You have to re-enter it in again, again, again. And that's that's one way that we could do it. See? So why don't why don't we try that? Why don't we try that? So we can ask the user for a number. And if they enter something non-numeric, we can require them to enter it again. So we're looking at the ASCII code from 48 through 57. Okay, so we can say here, okay, let's use, let's use, let's use cn.get. Okay, so now we have a to continue that's going to have a character. To continue is going to have a character. Okay. Um, truth is, we've set to continue as an integer, but characters and integers, they they can work together, right? Like the truth is that when you have a character inside C++, it's being, it's it, you you have an int. Right, so chars, let's just write it out like this. Chars and ints are, what's the best way to put it? They are um, equivalent. That's a decent way of putting it. All right, so we're gonna say, while to continue, interchangeable, I like that. While to continue is less than 48 or to continue is greater than 57, then we need to have them enter it in again. So we're going to put the prompt in here and we'll ask them again. We'll say, look, enter the value again as a number. So I guess, I guess the main point of all this is when you're debugging things, you test things. If it doesn't work, you look up what could possibly, what it could possibly be. You try to change it. You run it again. You try to change it. So it's an iterative process. Writing software isn't just something like you look at, you look at a sheet of paper and you say, okay, type this, and then you're done. It's you try something and then if it doesn't work, you fix it and you try something and you fix it and try something. It, it's just the way it goes. Like there's, there's no way around it in here. Okay. So let, let's go ahead and test this. I mean, we, I may have an error. Let's see. <clears throat> okay. So. We have here A for Python. All right. Enter any other number to continue. Ah, look what happened here. See, something did get broken. We typed A for Python. And then after we did the enter, we needed the cn.ignore, right? After the user entry. So after this, now we need to say, cn.ignore. Okay, let's try it again. A for Python, enter zero to quit, any other number to continue. So we'll do one. Okay, looks good. And then we can do B for C. Okay, good. Now let's try, uh, let's try the letter P. Okay, so now we got a problem. If we say P, it's going to show two times 
enter the value as a number, and that's because of the cn.ignore. So we would actually have to put in here cn.ignore for the enter. Let's try it again. A for Python. We'll say P. Well, no. Um, yeah, yeah, we'll try P. There it is. Then we'll do eight. See, now it's working. D, zero to quit. Hmm. Look here. The zero to quit is now a problem. <laughs> See all the debugging that goes into these things? So now we're treating to continue like a, a character. And we're, we've got the value of 48 in there. So we've, we've come so far from our original thing that we can go ahead and write another if statement in here where we can say Why don't we do this? If, if to continue equals zero, then we break. Let's see if this does the trick. Okay, so A for Python, zero to quit. Perfect, nice. Okay, so here's the finished thing. We, we sort of like added things to the program as we were going along, so we changed different directions that we were going in just based on what students were saying, which was good. Like, I think we explored some things. Um, but I think the, the process of debugging is, is not always super, super simple, right? You have to think about, okay, what, what am I doing here? What am I doing here? Is this a smart way of doing it? And sometimes maybe you go so far in one direction, it might make sense to just delete the code and start over because sometimes you add so many hacks into your code and things are getting so messy it just becomes like really not pretty so that that may happen to you when you go real far down one path and then you say look this is not a good path i'm going to delete it and then start over so the fact that some of you did have issues with running the loops and Resetting the loops, that's, that's not wasted time. It's really not. It's, it's just the reality. So any questions or thoughts about this? Yeah, it's just it's just a simple menu. It's like people if we if we sat here we could think of new ways to break it. And and that's what testers do. So sometimes they're called QA testers and that might be some people's first jobs. I know out of college I had some friends who majored in this field and then that was their first job. Um well, no, no, no. It's it's if this is a real program, you got to. Like you have to. You have to for real programs because you don't, you don't want your program always breaking and, and people calling you up saying, hey, what's, what's wrong with this? It's not working. Now, for, for this class, I, I, I did see like a wide range of, of student work. Like some people put in things like, and I'm not doing this to like shame anybody, but they did things like IOMANIP for the output where like all the money would have two decimal places, um, you know, for their small business. So they would have the dollar sign, the amount, and then exactly two decimal places. They would use um, tables for displaying things. Um, they would do error checking. And so, yeah, those students probably put in a lot more time on it. Now I'm thinking that those students really enjoy this whole process of programming. So for them, it wasn't like, you know, it wasn't like, oh, this is a waste of time. I could be, um, I could be lighting off M80s fireworks and I don't have anything against fireworks. I, I hope you guys did do fireworks. It's just like day after day of fireworks, maybe, yeah, it's time, like my neighbors did fireworks for days and days. I don't know. 
I don't know where they got all the money for fireworks, but the, the point is like now that you're studying this field, you got to spend a lot of time on it if you really, really want to improve your abilities, right? So yeah, some students, it looks like they put in tons of time and they added lots of things to the program and then other people, and that was really unnecessary because I didn't put it into the homework. I didn't say, oh, I'm going to try to break it and look for ways to stop the user from breaking it. I think I would advise everybody to look into new features, but there is a reality that we can talk about right here. Some people in this class, um, they know they don't want to be programmers. They just have to take it for a major that added it in, right? So a major adds it in, you know, these course requirements change. So somebody who doesn't want to be a developer now has to take C++. Or maybe their family said, you have to learn programming, take C++. And they, they couldn't get out of it. So like they're just obeying and they're, take, they're taking the course. Um, yeah, maybe for them, they're not going to be as motivated to try to learn as much as other people who are doing it because they really want to break into this field. Like they want to get really good at it. So I think you're always going to have different levels of interest in this course. But overall, the level of interest in this course is way, way higher than those courses that everybody has to take. Like the courses that everybody has to take, um, man, you like I used to be a high school economics teacher and mm, students did not like taking economics. And after a while, I didn't like teaching economics. It, I didn't enjoy it. <laughs> so well, I appreciate that you're enjoying the course, but uh, I, you know, for economics, like a lot of people are put into the course. They're, they're especially, I had to teach a course called AP macroeconomics. And AP macroeconomics, you have so many charts and graphs. Has anybody in here ever taken that course, AP macroeconomics? Yeah, I just took it. You just took it. I mean, you have to do all these graphs and charts that you practically can hardly even find any real-world applicability anymore. I mean, I guess the basic ideas of supply and demand, they count, but uh, uh, so, so much of it didn't even seem empirical anymore. It just seemed like... Um, it was easy though. Yeah, you learn the charts and then and then you you do it. But I mean, okay, whatever. So this is just my opinion. I didn't like teaching the class anymore. The seniors in high school didn't didn't like taking it. Supply to the sky, demand to the dirt. But you know, this this is a class where not everybody is forced to do it. Some people are being forced to be here. Most most just really want to be here. So I would say the more, to get back to the original question, the more that you can play with features and add things on, the better, just for learning the language and for trying things out and to, to just sort of have that mindset of we're going to, yeah, win and out, graph it out. <laughs> um, that's, that's probably the rules for, for the AP macro course. Just draw lots of graphs. Okay, so... I see Jose typing something, then we can move on. No, finish your thought. Or unmute yourself. You can you could just say it. Although I do like the typing because then it's like a record of what we said. Um okay, so yeah, let's let's now move on to let's now move on to Memer. That's that's a great segue. So we'll leave AP macro behind and we'll go to class.memer.io. And let's look at the C++ assignments. So the looping fun assignment. Okay. So the looping assignment. Um, all right. All right. So let's, let's take a look at this here. Um, so let's go ahead and open in Memer IDE and let's sort of like do a live coding example. So we'll go here to summer C++. And 
I think that was called the basic math, right? Um, is that what it was called? No, it was called looping fun. These names I think of looping fun. Okay, so for this variable, you're going to create a bool variable. So we have bool b, and I got to do it outside the comment, of course. So we've got bool b, and then string s, which I don't even, don't even think we use, and then int i, and then double d. So the first part is just practice with types, right? I want you to think about what are these different variable types and then how to make them. And then we have some questions that we're going to ask the user. Okay, so the first question is enter a number with a decimal to find the square root. No, first prompt is enter an integer value to square. So we can write out here, enter an integer value to square. Yeah, it's just something just randomly added in. And then we've got here an integer value to square. And then looks like it's going to need to be a new line. And then we're going to have to read that into i. So we say cn into i. No, we did. Somebody just wanted me to review it. So yeah, everybody has pretty much done it, but just to review. Well, Memer, Memer grades this assignment. Memer grades it. Okay, so Roger wants to make it quicker. All right, so let's let's look at this code here. Actually, that makes things a lot quicker. Okay, so let's go here. Let's paste it here. And let's save it. And then let's try to first compile it. So to compile it, we have to use, let's see. Um, Let's see, C++, wait a minute, it was C++, um, name that CPP, is that it? No, that's not it. Okay, let me go back to Replit. See, I always have to go back and look at things because I forget. When we run things in Replit, what is the, what is the command again to run it from the command line? Let's see. C plus plus seventeen main dot cpp. Did I not type that in? C. Oh, they they use G plus plus in this. Okay. 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 So they have C plus plus fourteen. Could I just do G plus plus main dot cpp? Yeah, that was good. Okay. Yeah. So. They have different, they have different um, compilers. So this is the G++ compile C++. So this is the GNU C++ compiler. So just to talk about it. All right, so GNU, GNU is an open source. Actually, let's look up GNU for a second. GNU is worth talking about. Okay, so this is where they develop the free operating system, free programming language uh, compiler. And just if you wanted to learn more about it, that's it. So this is part of the Free Software Foundation. Okay, anyways, let's get back to our business. So here we are at the, your, your code compiles. And I think if we do period forward slash a dot out, it should run. Enter an integer value to square. We have five. Enter a number with a decimal to find the square root. 25. Okay. 25 is five squared. Five is the square root of 25. And then we can say uh, enter one to continue. Okay, three, 3.3, zero to stop. Okay, so it looks good. Let's go ahead and submit it for a student. So let's go to 
Well, I'll just submit it for myself and see if it works. So I can right click here, submit folder contents. And then we go to, it's called looping fun, right? Looping fun. And then we say view submission. Okay, so let's see why. Let's see what the problem is. So we go here to read numbers and it says no main file. Okay. So what is going on here? Okay, so I have I have this in the wrong spot, I think. Um Oh, I clicked on the wrong folder, didn't I? I clicked on basic math. Yeah, I clicked on basic math. Okay, so it says not graded. I just have to release the grades. But if you if you look at the test cases, you can see what you got. All right, so yeah, I clicked on basic math. So we go here to looping fun. We right click here. We say submit folder contents. And then we're gonna do it to Looping fun, view submission, and okay, so it did fail, so that's kind of good because yours failed, and so this one failed too. I mean, if it worked for me and not for you, that would be really bad, but let's see why mine, let's see why this failed. So we click here on read numbers, and we see, oh, you're going to be really mad. <laughs> it's just it's just a few things in here. You see it says enter a number with a decimal to find the square root, but the correct answer is supposed to be Okay, so your code's output is enter a number with a decimal to find square root. So let's just write to Roger. That's that's your prompt. And then the correct, correct prompt is like this. So it's just a matter of adding in just the word the, and then it's a matter of um, these, these periods. So the correct output does give a period. So this is correct. Also note the period. So you see this is correct, and then this here, okay? So go ahead and fix that, and then you can submit it, and then it should be good. But it's really important when you get your feedback from Memer to look here. I'm, I'm really glad we're using class time for this. this. This is very valuable, what we're doing now. Yeah, also after the other one. They both have to have periods. But this is the most common reason I get messages from students. I get messages from students all the time, and they have to go in to Memer and look at what the debugging means. And you see what your output is, and then you see what Memer is expecting. So it's it's tiny things. It's things like colon, super, super picky. It's colons, it's periods. Those things can make you have to fix, stop, and fix it, and then resubmit it. Yeah, you really do. You have to look at things with a microscope. And um, I, I, I like telling this story, but I think it's, it's worth telling. So uh, three summers ago, I taught, I taught a Python class where the students had to do a final project where it was a supermarket. So it was a menu-based supermarket. And the, yeah, I, I like that it is good practice on being a perfectionist. I really do, especially for this field. So the students in Python had to have A for bread and then B for milk, or, you know, maybe it was M for milk, something like that. And, and each time, the user came through. It was like a self-checkout system. So 
the user was saying, I bought this, I bought this, I bought this. And then at the end of the program, at the end, the total for the groceries was given. So for the end of a whole semester of programming, that's not a lot of work. You guys could do that final exam. If I said in C++, press A for this, press B for this, most of you, I'm pretty confident just from what people have turned in and what people are capable of, I think you could get it working. So that was really just like an easy final. And this, most students got an A on it, but one student, uh, the code didn't work. Like his prices, it didn't loop, the prices were bad, nothing was, it was terrible. Everything was bad. So he was, he kept trying to write these emails saying why it didn't matter and how he understood all the concepts. And I, like, at a certain point, that's just so ridiculous because if your purpose is to write a program to keep track of some basic food and your program doesn't do it, you just have to admit, okay, this failed. I didn't do it. You can say all you want. Oh, I like to think about programming languages, but if it doesn't keep track of the food, now that's way different from the periods and the colons that we, we started talking about here. But I think why I bring up that story is because some people will like keep pressing the topic of, oh, this doesn't matter, this doesn't matter. I think the way Roger said, okay, yeah, I'll, I'll fix it, no problem. That, that's the right attitude. But when people have the attitude of, well, that doesn't matter, that doesn't matter, pretty soon none of your programs have any connection to reality or anything working. So it's, it's just really important that you um, just keep that perfectionist mindset. It's also funny when I look here at the A dot out and I look at the, some of the output, didn't we just talk about GNU? And now we see there's GNU on my screen. So if we copy this, so GNU, that's an acronym. That's, that's something that we're seeing. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Sorry, I'm a pseudo coder. That's, that's essentially what the student was saying in the email, which if you look at it, sounds so ridiculous. It sounds foolish, but um, I mean, look, pseudo code is part of it. You understand the problem. You get a feel for what's going on. You write out notes to yourself. You can look at those flow charts we do. I don't know if you like doing flow charts, you can make flow charts, but in the end, you do have to take those ideas and then put them into code, which can run and execute and give something meaningful. So, all right, very good. So now you actually do have a new assignment on Memer, which initially I was gonna have like for an in-class exercise, but it's, it's, it, some people need more time, so it's not an in-class exercise. So let's, let's look at it. It's called looping through numbers. Okay, so let's all look at looping through numbers. So I guess I'll give props for the two people who did it yesterday in my C++ class. So those students did it pretty quickly. And it says, maybe some people in here will, two people in here will get it done. So it says, write a program that uses while loops to perform the following steps. First, prompt the user to input two numbers, first num and second num. Now, this problem, we're just focusing on the logic of the loops. Focus, focus on the logic of the loops. Okay, we're, we're not worried about, please enter a number, period. We're just, we're just writing the CN, that's it. Just the CNs. Don't worry about any sort of prompt. Because if you do, Memer will mark it wrong. Okay, if first num is larger than second num, require the user to enter the numbers again. So while first num is greater than second num, then require them to enter it again. Now, if you look at it here, do not let the user continue without entering a first num less than the second num. I'm going to actually change my writing here, the way I wrote this. And I'm going to change it to, if the first number is larger or equal to the second num. OK, 
Okay, so we'll make it real specific here. So, so you're, there's nothing printed out to the screen, nothing printed out to the screen. All you're doing is making the CN statements. So the CN will read in something to first num and then read in something to second num. Now, if they enter the first num larger or equal to the second num, then you have to require them to enter it again. Do not let the user continue without entering a first num less than the second num. And then we have to do more looping. So then you're going to output all the odd numbers between first num and second num, inclusive. So let's look at this example here. We're going to enter in 2 for the first num and 7 for the second num. Then we are going to print out all the odd numbers. So what are the odd numbers? Well, 3 is odd, 5 is odd, and 7 is odd because we're inclusive. We're including the last number. And then we have to output the sum of all the numbers between first num and second num. Well, now we're not worried about odd anymore. So let's do the math. 2 plus 3 is 5. Okay. 5 plus 4 is 9. And then 9 plus 5 is 14. Oh, gosh. I have to do all the way. The answer is 27, right? So, so it just gives you the answer to 27. I'll probably make some mistake in my mental math going along the way. So, yeah, you get the idea. You just sum up all the numbers. Like if we do, let's do simpler numbers. One, one is the first num. Let's do real simple numbers. One is first num, and then three is second num. Okay, one plus two will give us three. Three plus three will give us six. So. 6 is the sum. So then that's what you output. You output that sum without any additional talking. Like you don't say 6 is the sum. You just say 6. No period, just 6. So you see here on the sample run. Okay. All right, so any questions about this assignment here? Okay, so the assignment is to really focus on loop writing. All right. So the focus is on while loops. Okay. So yeah, the percent sign, the modulus will be helpful. Percent or mod will be helpful. So for this, for this problem, you're you're first reading in, you're first declaring variables. So let's sort of do the, the steps to solving this. So we can just write the steps to solving this just in English. So first, we're going to declare two variables, first num and second num. So we need two variables, first num and second num. And then, we need to check to see if the first num is less than the second num. So we can say, while the first num is greater than or equal to the second num, let's write it out in English, is greater than or equal to the second num, ask again with CN. Oh, you know what? You know, I'm gonna re I'm gonna redo this. Instead of number two being checking that, that's gonna be number three. And number two is going to be number two is going to be read in two int integers from the console from the keyboard. Okay. 
right? So reading in from the console means C in. Okay. So then, if they're good and the second num is greater than the first num, then loop through the numbers from first num to second num and show all the odd numbers. And by show, display them to the console, display them to the screen. Okay. And then lastly, we can, if you want to do three loops, you can, you don't need to, but loop through all the numbers, including the first and last and display the sum. So you could think of this as type of pseudocode. It's could maybe be could maybe take out a little more of the English idioms and try to make it more code like. But the point is you're not writing things like int int i equals this. Well, yeah, for sure. I mean, listen, C++ introductory programming for a long time. This is this is just a reality. Any introductory programming class has a high dropout rate. It really really does. I mean, I remember just seeing the class get smaller and smaller as time went on and um, it's just, it's just really, it's a challenging subject. And I've gotten a few emails from students where they say, I just don't like doing this. I can't stand it. Uh, I don't know. I guess that's their like goodbye memo to me, like no hard feelings. Usually, I don't know. I would imagine people would just drop, but sometimes they want me to know their feelings like they're dropping. They just don't like doing this sort of thing, right? It's just, it's just not, it doesn't agree with them. And, and I think it's a shame because sometimes if people, well, first of all, if they've tried it and they really, really hate it, then yeah, they're, they're making a smart choice. But if it's just about like dealing with the failure, everybody is going to have failures. Um, no, no, I would disagree with that. No, no, no. I, I would say, I would say you could, you could be a good programmer and struggle in discrete math. Um, as long as you put the time in and the effort in. I mean, it's time and effort can go a really, really long way in terms of in terms of learning this stuff. Like, I actually have a, a really good story. I see a lot of people are typing, but I would say I would say no. Keep at it. Yeah, I mean, discrete math is is a it's a, a serious subject, you know. Um, so somebody says you don't like programming, you like game development. Well, th now there's another side to game development. You can also look into the magic department here at MDC. I mean, just to keep you in the MDC family, I guess. Um, and they focus on like stories and they focus on creating characters and using things like Maya and, um, I don't know, 3D Max. Like they have all this different software that they use to develop characters and and that's a whole element of game programming too right all right so then we have another message here that says um i fixed it up it still passes one of the five tests test cases so you're saying it it passes all the test cases but one okay well why don't you do this why don't you take a screenshot of the failed test case, and then we'll all sort of help you. I feel like if I dodge programming as a game developer, I'll never evolve and do what I want. Well, I mean, like we were talking about specializing earlier and 
um, I think that if you specialize just in in designing characters and doing 3D modeling, 3D modeling is is an important skill, you know. And <laughs> I don't I don't think the programming language. I mean, they might become easier. I don't know, but I know that programming languages last for a long time. Like <laughs> Python's been around for decades. Java's been around for decades. C++ has been around for decades. All right, good. So we got a screenshot here. All right, so we have here, it says, enter one to continue after this example. Okay, so it looks like, it looks like yours is not quitting. So let's see why. <clears throat> so it looks like you say at the end, oh, I see, I see the problem. I think I can help you with this. You see how you say enter one to continue after this example or zero to stop? Well, if you want to break right there, you can just add an if statement there, okay? If I equals zero, then you can just break out of the loop. And the break statement works well for that. Use break to exit a loop. So give that a try, just immediately after that line. So, you know, it's it's so funny that we were talking about a program la um, programming language development and, and languages that are simpler. Well, C++ versus Python, no comparison. Python is simpler. Let me let me just show you guys this. We we still have class time and and I think this is a totally valid thing to look at. So let's look at the C++ language specification. All right. So here we have All right, let's see. Let's look up the, don't they have a PDF here? Okay. Um, gosh, even, even just looking up their documentation is, ah, oh, they make you, they make you run instructions to get a PDF. Wow. This is, this is the most C++ thing ever. Um, Okay, where's just a PDF? I guess they make you look at it in, in latex. Um, I think I saw the 14 edition. Okay, here's a PDF. So this gets back to the whole 14 versus 17 we were talking about. You know, different like different versions of C++. Okay. Um Yeah, okay. So let let's let's look at this PDF. This PDF is so giant that to just load it up took forever. So it's 1,260 pages. 1,260 pages for C++. All right. Now, this is the standard for programming language C++. Standard for programming language C++, 1,260 pages. So you see Google Inc. involved, you know, all the big tech companies are going to have some, some input on this because this is very important to them, right? They're going to be in the standards bodies because it's huge for them. Okay, so that's the C++ standard. Now let's look up the Python language. Okay, let's go to the actual, 
Let's go to the Python language reference. Let's let's go look that up. Okay, and let's look that us up in a PDF file just so we can compare the two things. PDF. Um, okay, so here we have. Right, here we have the Python language. So it takes a little while. I've got to unzip things and search for them. Okay, so we go here, docs.pdf. Let's open this up in... Mm, Okay, this, this looks good. The Python library reference, that's not really like the full, let's see. Let's see if this is similar. Mm. Built-in functions, built-in types, built-in exceptions, data types. Hmm. Oh, it's much longer. Okay, well. All right, so I, I take back what I said earlier. <laughs> so it's longer for C, for Python. Well, Python, I still would say is simpler. Python, <laughs> it's actually much longer for Python. It's it's kind of hard to compare like the, the diff yeah, like they might've had a lot of different libraries in there. Um, I don't know. So that, that example didn't go the way I expected. <laughs> I thought C++ would have a lot more, a lot more for their standards, but whatever, no big deal. Um, Python's a really powerful language. You might be interested in it. C++, oh yeah, yes, totally. It, yeah, way, way faster. It's, it's no comparison. Like C++ versus Python, if you're, if you're concerned about speed or working in, in an embedded system or something where there's not a lot of memory, you got to go with C or C++. But a lot of data scientists who don't care if something runs for 10 minutes or 20 minutes, they just are interested in the time that it takes them to program it, then they're more interested in Python. So Python is for the programmer, I would say the programmer's ease of use. I don't think that's like a really controversial statement that I'm making here. Like if, if I was to look this up, is Python easier than C++? You'll probably find a lot of people saying the same thing. Python is an easy to use programming language in comparison to C++. Here's Quora, which is a pretty good website. Of course, it's Python. It's much simpler than C++, no discussion. I mean, yeah. Whatever. It, it, it's, it's not really an important question because Miami-Dade has you guys take, take C++ first, right? So no big deal. Anyways, um, there we go. So we just had a little bit of a discussion on different programming languages and um, ease of use. I guess we're going to discuss something called pointers in C++ at some point in the semester. And um, that, that can be a little challenging for students. They often find that to be a, a challenging topic. But I think it helps to understand what's going on with the computer a little bit with the memory locations. Whereas maybe other langu languages abstract more. So you're a little closer to the hardware with C and C++. So C, C++ is closer to the hardware. So that's, that's probably a benefit. Like we'll talk about benefits of why you're learning this language first. Yeah, it is. It is. It's, it gives you a lot of power and, and speed when you're programming. Yeah, pointers, it's, it's often found to be a confusing thing. 
So if if you wanted to just jump back and, and start learning like C plus plus pointers. And our favorite materials point. All right, so we have a question about the about the assignment. All right, so yeah, I would like you to use I would like you to use while loops. So we'll say while loops. So, so yeah, it it's true. Like Memer will mark it correct if you do for loops, but only because I asked for while loops, I'll I'll just try to keep it consistent. So, only because it's asked for. Um, I think the quickest way would just be have the, to me, the quickest way would be just have one loop to make sure they enter the right number. And then the next loop, get the sum next loop, get sum and print odd numbers. So you can do it two loops, two loops is the way to go. We are only using odd numbers to sum. No, that's all the numbers. So, so there's there's two different parts to this assignment. So we have here. Now we're on looping through numbers, right? Okay. So somebody else just finished it. Okay. So um, the first number is two. The second number is seven. So what do we do with those numbers? First, we output all the odd numbers. So you're going to use the modulus. So we check, is 2 even or odd? Well, it's even. 3, is 3 even or odd? It's odd, so we display it. 4 even, we don't display it. 5 odd, so we display it. 6 even, we don't display it. 7 odd, we display it. OK, so now we printed out all the odd numbers between the two. 3, 5, 7. And then we have to sum all the numbers between first num and second num inclusive. So if we wanted to, we'll just go ahead and do the math for these numbers. We can just go to Google and see what their little doodle is today. No doodle today. So we can say 2 plus 3 plus 4 plus 5 plus 6 plus 7. Okay, so we add them together, we get 27. So before I was sort of like talking through it, but I was sure I was going to make some kind of mental math mistake. But yeah, that's the idea that you add all of them for the sum, including the numbers entered. Okay, so somebody in this class did just finish the assignment as, as we were talking about, it, which I think is good. Like, yes, you know, I, I finished it like a few minutes ago. And, and, and that shows it is possible to do it in, in a short period of time, right? So, so this isn't something you have to like agonize over. I mean, if it doesn't work for you, then you'll have agony <laughs> and then you'll have to keep trying again and fixing it and fixing it and fixing it. But it's not a lot of code. So Sergio, how many lines of code is yours? Mine was uh, 19 lines. Yeah. So so this this can be done brief, not not tons of lines of code, right? Like like if if you've written hundred lines, something's not good. 
there's there's a problem. But with all that said, you know, maybe you'll you'll have to spend some time on this. Maybe the logic won't come to you immediately. But that's that's fine, right? That's not a huge deal. That's the learning process. Okay, I'm gonna go ahead and take a couple screenshots to take attendance. Yeah, that's definitely the best thing to do the assignments early instead of waiting. All right, so what other questions do you guys have about the assignment? That's true. There's also quiz five to do. So let's see, Jonathan writes, so we input two numbers and the last three in the sum is printed. No, not last three. So it's not the last three. It's all the odd numbers between the two including the numbers. So if they enter three and seven, then, you know, the three is going to be included, the seven is going to be included. Yeah, exactly. Like, I don't wanna, I don't wanna type out too much of the assignment. Somebody keeps doing a fox for everything. I guess that means, so we pick two numbers. Well, Memer will send in the two numbers. Memer will send in the two numbers. So when testing, like I'm just gonna give random number. I told Memer to give these different random numbers. So when you're testing it, I would say first start with two and seven. And then if your two and seven looks the way it looks on here, you're on the right path, right? So if your two and seven gives you this, <laughs> Julia is putting the fox on everything. If your two and seven gives this, then you're in good shape. Okay. So that, that would be the strategy. All right. So any other questions? Otherwise I've taken attendance and I think we're done. So have a nice day. Can you use a switch? Um, 